Now, as the legal challenges to the presidential election results move inexorably closer to having their day in court, so is the tension rising with the sounds of verbal protests and counter-protests, with both sides refusing to concede any ground. Well, those verbal protests have taken on a more frightening tone recently with the Minister of Information, Lai Mohammed, accusing Mr. Peter B of the Labour Party of treason and of stirring up insurrection, charges Mr. B and his team have vigorously denied. But the minister has persisted in his accusations and has raised questions about whether the government has been balanced, fair and proportional in its response to the genuine grievances that many in the opposition feel about how the 2023 presidential election was conducted and the results that emerged from it. So as the country continues to heat up and the inauguration draws ever closer, how much more tense are things likely to get? Well, to help us get a frame of reference on the political news and issues of the day, I'm joined now in the studio by the noted election and post-election socio-political analyst, Professor Udenta Udenta, who's also the founding national secretary of the Alliance for Democracy. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. It's a pleasure, Charles, to be with you once You've got more. great sprite in your eyes. Thank you so much. It always tells me that you're blazing intellectually once again. I don't know about that, but <laughs> let's just get, have a crack at it. How alive would you say Nigerian politics is right now? I mean, you've got the world waiting to hear from the judiciary and hoping that the judges will deliver justice. We've got the country on tenterhooks amid accusations of treason and religious and ethnic incitement, threats of arrest, etc. Is this a momentous political moment for Nigeria? A momentous political moment means that our democratic practice is alive. I don't know whether it is healthy, because to live doesn't mean to be in a healthy form. You talked about momentous events, you talked about narratives and counter-narratives, protests and counter-protests, accusations and counter-accusations. These are signs of the vibrancy of a tradition. But whether it is a it is signs of a vibrant decay of that tradition, or even vibrant decomposition of the post-colony, only time will tell. What I can say for sure is that there's always a noted tension between constitutional governance and democratic practice. What do I mean by this? The constitution is a text that guides virtually everything we do in an organized system like ours. The practice is what is derived from the text. The first arm is the assembly, the parliament that makes the law. Mm. The second is the executive that implements and the judiciary that adjudicates, and then civil society, the media, and the rest of us that actually live our life in a democratic system. When the life we lead conflicts with the constitutional provisions, Tension is noted. For example, what do I mean? If an election is organized in a fraudulent matter, manner and result declared, not in concert with the expectations of the people, there is a wide gulf between constitutional order and practice. This is what happened with the Arab Spring. Virtually all the countries of the Arab Spring had constitutions, had parliament. Hmm. They make laws. But when there is a gulf between the laws you make and the way the laws are implemented, and that gulf becomes wide by the day, people could decide to seek self-help. We wish that this democratic process does not end up at the level of self-help. For now, the key gladiators have been measured and restrained those who feel hurt and injured by the result Einig declared after the 25th February presidential election. Atiko Bako of, of PDP is well restrained. He's gone to court. His deputy governor Kowa is well restrained. He's gone to court. Peter B is well restrained. With that element, well restrained. It's part of that is very tough words. That's why they're seeking the judicial process for adjudication. Mm -hmm. So for anybody, either in government or out of government, to talk about fascism or fascistic behavior or insurrectional behavior or treasonable behavior is sorely unbecoming and completely irresponsible. At this stage, the country is hurting and people are hurting. What they need is an assurance from the powers that be, the government of the day, that justice will be secured. That's why the courts are there. What he need from INEC is to pick himself up from the tattered dignity, you know, of his broken life. And they begin to think about what could have happened if we had done things in a different form. When you cast aspersions on people, 
You do not know the consequences of those aspersions they cast on them. I speak with a sense of responsibility. In 2011, Lai like Mohammed is part of APC. 2011, our dear president, and I respect the institution of the presidency, and I respect the person of the president, they didn't behave properly. The dogs and baboons were caught up in blood. Hundreds of core members, youth coppers, young, vibrant boys and girls serving this country were caught down in the prime of their life. Thousands of houses were raised across the north because they felt injured by the result of that 2011 election. And millions poured out in the street. I think who hasn't done so, and neither has it been done so. So for a government functional like Lai Mohammed to speak about trees in faraway America is irresponsible. And for a revived relation in the Nobel laureate, we all respect him as a sage, as Kongi, to descend into the fray. Having lost his moral compass in this particular circumstance is equally very shocking for people like us who hold him in high esteem. So as we await the adjudication, adjudicatory processes unleashed by the judiciary from the tribunal to the Supreme Court, the debate must be robust. The engagement must be keen. Look at Paris. That's a doyen of European civilization. For months caught up in all these cycles of violence and, and petitions and, and protests and marches. That's the beauty of democracy. He can't show that conversation. He can't tell a tickle not to litigate or not to ask his supporters to protest peacefully. Absolutely. The Labour Party though suggests that all these apparent threats are aimed at trying to focus attention away from the strength of their legal challenge against the president-elect I, I wonder what your assessment is of how strong a case they've got and, and also that the pdp had. i'm not a lawyer hmm. let me deposit that right up front but i'm a thinking being that is a sense of having been in school and having read well to the degree that no human being can bamboozle me with thoughts and opinions. So I know my way around the system. Atiku Abubakar's case, I have the document. Peter B's case, I have the document. But I carefully put out documents by well-selected legal minds. The two things that stand out on the both documents from the PDP and the Labour Party is the depth of the data, her nest, the degree of the technical details devoted in mounting a robust legal challenge, and the mounting of evidence that we cumulatively, I believe, persuade the justices at the end of the day that the writing must be done. What equally the moral dimension of this catastrophe that befell the country in the form of this last presidential election? The moral contrast of the nation is under threat, and Labour captured it well with the case of the president-elect in faraway America on drug-related matters. That has further been mainstreamed in the judicial conversation, no longer as a tangential or peripheral element to be dismissed outrightly by media guys or strategic communications of that formation. But now the judges will litigate at the lower level, and the Supreme Court justices will litigate this matter. The foundations of the moral order, together with a powerful, data-driven position which the PDP Atiku together constructed, may well drive this into a conclusion beyond what I can speculate now. But that is strong enough. And for me, if the Bolatinibu wing and the government of the day supporting it understand the robustness of this challenge, they should better focus their energy on it. If you try to throw you know, shade at people in terms of banding very strong works from the DSS about people trying to form an interior government, issue of treason, issue of insurrection. Unpack these three elements. Interim government is an arrangement only the government of the day can arrange. The government of Mohammed Buhari, in concert with the military, have the capacity to arrange an interim government scenario or infrastructure. Nobody in the street can do it with your brooms, or your cornfields, or your banner, or your t-shirts, or flyers, you decide on interim government. Mm. It's only the government that can. And treason is a potent way they don't wave, away, wave around. If someone is accused of treason, you must pick the person up and begin to interrogate to find out the conspirators, co-conspirators of that treasonable something. That people walk around free because they're Democrats who have persuaded themselves that they have to go through the judicial apparatus to seek for redress, and yet as a minister, you're banding West treason and insurrection. That is meaningless.
Well, let, let's turn to the elections tribunal and the legal challenges. You touched on it briefly that are coming up. I mean, some very well respected lawyers and no lesser person that the former president of the Nigerian Bar Association, Ulisa Abakoba, senior advocate of Nigeria, have urged the tribunal to try and conclude the petitions against Bola Tinubu's victory before the swearing in of a new president on May the 29th. Given how politically charged things are currently in Nigeria. Do you agree that the hearings should be accelerated? Because part of the reason why all these agitations are going on is simply, as Elisa pointed out, because the issue of the presidential election remains unresolved. Okay, the issues are very much unresolved up in the air. Indo Anek has spoken and uh, he's been derided for speaking the way Mani did. Look at this basic issue of the contradiction of the INEC apparatus, the chairman and the spokespersons they're talking about, the glitches and the difficulty they have to upload this result, which means in spite of their best effort, a transcendent moment occurred, something beyond their control. And then Lion Mohammed, as if he's the chairman of INEC, with information the rest of us do not have. Oh no, it was a deliberate intentional act to pause it in order to avoid the back end or the backbone infrastructure being compromised by hackers. That is very alarming to say the least. That is number one. If INEC knows what is before Nigeria and the rest of the world over this particular matter, INEC should be well bordered comprehensively. The way and manner you put it out there, the legal challenges are constrained by constitutional provisions and enactments of the Electoral Act. I wish to align myself providentially and theoretically with the position for this about my good friend. But I do understand the nuances and the dynamics of this kind of power play. I think we do everything we want possible to drag this matter out. And APC will probably do the same. For the sanity of the democratic order, in order to avoid this tension between constitutional governance and democratic practice, that's the best route to go. Mm. But nobody's going to prescribe that for the judiciary. No matter how Bex they try to rush this case in order to accelerate the hearings, they could tell you that it's better to have a judgment that is well delivered in whatever time than to rush the extent and then have a miscarriage. Yeah. So even that happens, what I can counsel Nigerians, including those who are mortally and bitterly wounded, on this studio I talked about the catastrophe or the embarrassment to the nation if APC and Dinibu did do well. And they, apparently from what I next say, they did do well. You can see that sense of embarrassment unfolding every day. This is the most dramatic of the moments for us. And a lot of people, including the Sabah government, feel that this thing could push this country to a precipice. Mm. And the post colony could become institutionally and structurally decomposing. But my counsel to Nigerians, it may not be the best advice out there, is May 29 we come, even if the cases are not concluded. The president elected will be sworn in. That's Absolutely. what the law says. Yeah. But then it continues. Mm. And then protest matches, robust petition, canvassing positions, as well as the legal processes going on, must continue at pace. Well, the, the argument that um, Olisa makes, given his own legal experience, which is extensive, is that he reckons that at least three issues can be quickly resolved. One is the issue of 25% of the federal capital territory and its relevance to who becomes president. The other is whether a candidate is permitted to stand as a presidential or vice presidential candidate in an election when he is at the same time a senatorial candidate. And the third issue is related to the qualification of candidates to contest in a presidential election. He reckons these can be resolved within seven days because they are simply straightforward matters of law. I mean, I'm wondering whether you think he has a point because as he said, there is a certain unfairness about a petitioner challenging a president-elect who then, whilst the challenge is unresolved, goes on to get inaugurated. Brilliant position of law. And process. Mm. And I said, I align myself fully with it. And many other commentators who have shared this view, there are others who have shared this view, you know, in a different kind of format, a different kind of sense or perspective. His own is a three brilliant elements which are tied together in a whole, in almost a logical flow. I as, as align myself completely with it. My worry, and the worry of any student of Nigerian history and any realist, is as compelling as these views are, 
in order to salvage whether we will have the dignity of the nation and the sovereignty of the people already lost, according to them. With the judges, this now at the lower level, do the needful. But the problem, I don't know whether we decide tax him on what kind of space is looking at the tribunal space and then the Supreme Court space. Mm. As only the, the uh, tribunal in less than two months weighs on this matter, even in a week or two weeks, weighs on this matter and says conclusively, 25% we include the FCT, period. Two, it cannot be a nominee of the party senatorial and be the nominee for vice president, period. Three, there are many impediments to being a candidate, and we take one or two or three and say, you are head, snared, snared by those impediments. Can't even start as a candidate. They have a right to go to court, to, to, I mean, to the next level of people, Absolutely, Supreme they Court. Absolutely, they do, yeah. Supreme Court may not be as, may not rush their matter mm. as the Court of Appeal. And if the matter is not rushed, and we say, get beyond the 29th of May, the person pronounced by INEC as the president elect, we say you have to be sworn in. No, I, I agree to with that. I, I, think, yeah, no, absolutely. I don't know whether you I think, whether I think you're, pressed you're, him on that. I think that. you're very right. Mm. I think his argument is not so much that you, you could, I mean, you won't stop the process unless there is a, an absolute, I mean, final, conclusive judgment from the Supreme Court. But what he's saying is that it, it, it reduces first of all, the, um, the tension Absolutely. in society. Absolutely. Because now you're, you're making decisions on certain things. And you clearing those out of the way. The yeah. in order to focus and then you on leave the other issues, Fantastic. bigger issues, which could go on and I, on. I understand but that. But it kind of levels the playing field a little bit. It does, it does that, and right. I'm sure the most... And, and either gives confidence or takes away confidence the most that, important lesson, you know, this could be upturned or yeah, not. The most important lesson, Charles, we learn mm. from this is we still have to tinker with either the constitutional parameters or in terms of time frame mm. or even the electoral act specifying. If we parties did primaries in May, the previous year, and swearing it will occur May the next year, that's 12 calendar months, you could have a situation where primaries are done in May, concluded by early June, as we had in the, this instance, and the elections could be held in October. Mm. You hold this election because you have a sufficient four or five months threshold to complete even the Supreme Court adjudication before the May 29th swearing in. Mm. This is a harsh lesson. We never have had an election as bitterly contested as this one. Now the election weird issues of insurrection and treason are thrown up casually. We have seen a situation where a Nobel laureate, all of us virtually defy beyond canonization, begins to now have a cloud of doubt before him, you know, from losing the moral compass and talking about fascism. That's the most individualistic one thing I've ever seen in my life in terms of individuality of the human subject. Shweke is not bound to anything in terms of guided by individuals or spirits. He's his own being, his own entity, ontologically speaking. For him now to descend into the arena, you know, not make comments that are worthy of him before the election, with ethnic profiling, with violence in Lagos, and suddenly we into this matter. Many st stakeholders have said, is that the only thing we know? Well, in Absolutely fairness not. to him, he did condemn the issue of ethnicity and all the rest that of was, it. That was almost in, casual, in, almost in like a parenthetical, parenthetical construction in terms of narrative. That's mm -hmm. a different matter altogether. Let me not be too harsh on our mentor. Somebody brought us up in the field of literature with, with, with Lechi Noachabe. Focus on those in government. Focus on Lai Mohammed. Focus on the campaigning for social volatility. Focus on the people who speak for him, who write to NBC, who ask journalists to be sanctioned, sanctioned, when they've not even taken power. Nigerians should be allowed about what is coming before them. That's the real fascism Shurika should be talking about. A fascism of a president elect whose own strategic communication team is choking down the life of the media. is actually telling them to be prepared for having a rough ride that well, even never gave them. He treated the media women with contempt and then snubbed them. Okay, that's fine. He didn't care, he didn't bother. This was a telling you, we're going to match you every inch. The space you've created for yourself in the past eight years, we're going to shrink it. <laughs> well, listening to you talk, I'm quaking in my boots at the it's, 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 it's messy. Yeah, no, no, I mean, it's not funny. It's not funny. You do, you, I mean, it's, we'll have to see how it unfolds, how it unfolds because obviously there are, there are constitutional limits to what can be done and what can't be done. But you, of course, um, let's kind of change direction slightly. You supported the PDP and its candidate, Atiku Abubakar, in that election. Even though I've affiliated to the campaign. Yeah, yeah, no, you, you made it clear that you were not affiliated. I mean, you're perfectly entitled to support Absolutely. whoever you want. Mm -hmm. But do, do you find it a bit odd, to say the least, that the PDP isn't officially saying much during this, during this period of apparent crisis? The and Atiku Abubakar as well? Two parties come with different timbers 
or contours of performance or behavior when mm. it comes to post election matters. You know, a party like PDP can jolly well take it to the court anywhere. It's a party that is founded on a logic of inclusivity, of the elite. From 1998, the biggest fold, like an umbrella, accumulating Nigerian elite in a conventional orthodox political setup. The party is like a party of the conventional type. The party that's reliant on day-to-day -day programming. We have lawyers, we have to sit down with them. For the past two, three weeks, the party has been working tooth and nail, defining its, the legal boundaries of its challenge, dealing with the technical issues of its legal composition, looking at the case already submitted for adjudication and so on. The fate that is far more important and consequential down the line. But you can see that the Labour Party has not that conventional, orthodox, Timber, it is almost an unorthodox, it's orthodox, you know, with body that has come with a sense of energy. That energy is that sense of visionary zeal and eruption. That will always carry through in terms of the conversation it throws out there. Look at the team of people together, very powerful team led by brilliant lawyers, but look at what the buildings are doing on the social media and media space. Virtually they're telling the world that in spite of the case going on in court, we have the case for the people litigating against mm -hmm. INEC, the current government, Lai Mohammed, you know, Wale Shainka, Bolatini, and his team. So PDP approach is slightly different as a party that is benign in nature, a party that has seen it all in well, terms a party of that's power. More established. More establishment party. Some would say. Well, establishment party. Right. You know, and then the same time, Labour Party, less establishment minded. That means less difficult to constrain his energy and spirit. But I'm sure PDP, his strategic communication will soon pick up when this matter in court begins to be right. litigated. But it's been suggested that in the past election, I mean, the most recently held presidential election, which was characterized by regional voting to some extent, the PDP did not really properly predominate. And in areas where it used to be virtually unassailable, the Labour Party has eaten into its territory and denied a Tiku victory. Because obviously, if those states that Peter B won were added to the PDP, um, a Tiku Abubakar would have cruised to a comfortable victory. A wise pundit or analyst, or even a scholar of Nigerian politics and political practice, we hold his breath and hold his peace and keep his gunpowder dry at this stage of this kind of analysis, post-election analysis. We are not even at the post-election stage. We are at the post inec declaration stage. We don't know whether the premises are right or wrong. We don't know what the result could have been. We don't know what the outcome is going to be when the Supreme Court has weighed in. So who lost what and who, who won what mm. are still up in the air. That is why people are bitterly, in their millions, bitterly, you know, revolted by the excess of either. That's why they are even shocked by looking at the face of Mahmoud, you know, Yakubu Mahmoud. 300 billion we're talking about is not the only money. The EU basket of funding, bringing both the USAID, bringing the EU ISA, bringing the UNDP, bringing the DFI, the British arm, who have constituted close to 40, 50 percent extra again of the entire funding that INEC collected. Not to talk of civil society empowerment, not to talk of the kind of investment from foreigners about democratic governance, electoral practice, electoral reforms, and so on. If you put all these things together, you're talking about close to five, six hundred billion that Mahmoud blew with his team and produced this sham election and this in fickle minded resort. And when he talk about Lai Mohammed going to UX to talk the way Amana he spoke, they must have laughed at his back and said, we have ambassador, we have our team, we have election observers from the IRI and the NDI, the IFS and so on. They've given us everything we need to know. He can lecture to us about how well the election was conducted, whether it was credible, transparent or not. They're feeling out there globally. This is not a furious and furious election. It's the worst election ever conducted in the history of election in Nigeria. That's the way people look at it, including the British. Well, that's the way some people look that's at it. That's the way some people look at it. Ultimately, yes, not everybody can be in the same boat, mm. but that's the way a lot more stakeholders in their individuality and multi-form combination look at this particular matter. That is why I repeat what I said on several studios, including here. A sense of national embarrassment will occur if ABC does well. ABC apparently from INEC has done well in what that sense of national embarrassment is gripping the soul of the nation. That is where we are. But given, I mean, just turning back to the PDP again, I know you're not a spokesperson for the party, but I mean, your, your analysis is always so engaging. And given that you gave them your support um, unbidden during the last election, it's good to get your assessment sure. of, of where they are. Because given yet another electoral loss 
the third in succession after 2015 and 2019, added to the what appears to be never-ending internal wrangling within the PDP. How much of a, an important point of division is this in the PDP's history? Could, it, could this be a watershed moment that signals maybe not the end, but what's left of it could be so crisis-ridden that it will leave little ability to maintain a party that would continue to function competitively okay. going forward. Now you see, the, if you look at classical Greek mythology mm. and you look at the, the potent of Prometheus. Yeah, Prometheus, Prometheus unbound. Unbound yeah. from ashes of despair. Prometheus will rise. The phoenix the, like a rises. phoenix rises incarnating new life and new elements and new symbolisms. Well, you could argue that Nigeria has been in the ashes I'm for saying, a while. I'm the phoenix I'm hasn't I'm quite been I'm saying detected that, I'm yet. I'm saying that in the, in the context of the PDP, right. we're not looking at Didalus, another tragic, another mm. historical, you know, you know myth, myth, mythological figure. We're not looking at Icarus, mm. you know, getting burned by the sun like the yes, PDP getting burned. They were looking at the sense of Prometheus. That means, how do you arise from the ashes of despair? If in 2015, Jonathan, we don't know whether he lost or won, he felt that the goodness of the nation will triumph at the end of the day. My ambition, not with the blood of any Nigerian. He may not have won. We don't know how what happened in that election. Precisely. But when he litigated, he didn't go to court. 2019, a lot more people believe the outcome wasn't the outcome, but the infrastructure of incumbency may have done the magic. 2023 is even much more absurd in the sense that we don't even know what this outcome is going to be at the end of the day. So what the lesson for the PDP is like, from victory repeatedly in the formation of this republic to setbacks, occasioned by defeat, sometimes not genuine defeat, but at least officially sanctioned defeat. Yeah, but you could a make, lesson, you, you could make a lesson, the, a lesson has to be learned. Yeah, but you could make the same argument about the purported PDP victories because people challenged those victories of, as well and people yes, felt that yeah. they were using their power that of incumbency why, why, to perpetuate that's why I themselves about, that's in why power. I talk, that's a part I talk, talk about lesson learned. Yeah. Whether the victories officially sanctioned or whether they are organic defeats, hmm. whether somehow you lost, genuinely lost and just gave up hope. From defeat, you pick yourself up and say, what lesson will I learn from this latest debacle? Not caused by us, but caused by INEC. And we wish the court would not sustain this debacle. But if at the end of the day, God forbid the court sustain it, what lesson would we have learned? Are there internal mechanisms we didn't deploy? Are there come resolution steps and methods we didn't explore to the full? Are there some issues of campaign strategy and campaign operations we could have done in a different way? The time hasn't come for that. Because as I said, we don't know who won this election, we don't know who lost. INEC has made a pronouncement, so it's an INEC declared president elect, not the one validated by the Nigerian people, sanctioned by the constitution, pronounced by the courts. When that is done, PDP, Labour Party orders, we have to take a retreat, you know, have a, some leadership conference of a sort and begin to sort out the reads, you know, and say, what happened? What didn't mm. happen? How did we go from there? That time hasn't come yet. I have to say, Prof, it's an absolute delight sampling just a tiny bit of your intellect there and your assessment of the way things are and where they're headed in this country. I want to thank you very much indeed for joining us. And of course, Professor Udenta, Udenta is a noted election and post-election sociopolitical analyst. He's also the founding national secretary of the Alliance for Democracy. It's a pleasure thank you very much it's indeed. It's a pleasure to be with you. And that's it for this edition of Arise Primetime. Join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja and Lagos. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.